So far in this video series, I have created a make file that lets me build my project from the command line with make. I've also added a way to run static analysis using CPP check as well as shown how I work with Git. It's now time to bring these together into a continuous integration system using GitHub Actions and Docker. And the workflow I'm aiming for for each change or commit that I make is the following. First, I create a new local Git branch. I then make my code changes and I build the code and run static analysis on it. I then commit my changes to my branch and I push the branch or the changes to GitHub and open a pull request. And here is where the CI system that I'm setting up in this video comes in. Once I pushed my code, GitHub Actions will automatically build and run static analysis once more. And if it succeeds, I'm allowed to merge my pull request. And if it doesn't, I have to rework the pull request until it passes the CI system. In other words, the aim with the CI system is to prevent me from merging code that doesn't work so that my repository remains functional as I continuously deliver new incremental changes to it. Having a CI system System is common practice in the professional world these days. Of course, what I'm going to show you here is a much simpler CI system that you would normally find in a professional setting. But then again, so is the project I'm working on. But the goal of the CI system still remains the same, to automatically prevent new changes from breaking existing functionality. There are different platforms for implementing a CI system, but since I host my code on GitHub, I'm going to use GitHub Actions. And the way that works is that I'm going to add a configuration file to my Git repository to describe my CI workflow. And GitHub then takes care of realizing that into a series of jobs, a so-called pipeline that runs on their servers. There is a lot of configuration possibilities when it comes to GitHub Actions, but I'm going to keep things rather simple. However, by default, GitHub Actions spins up a CI job inside a virtual machine with a clean operating system installation, for example, Linux, but I'm actually going to complicate things a little further by running my CI job inside a Docker container. And the reason for that is that I'm using a particular set of tools a cross tool chain to compile code that executes on my target, the MSP430 microcontroller. And since this tool chain is not easily available from a clean OS installation, and since it's a bit too large for me to want to commit it into my Git repository, I'm instead going to create a Docker container that includes it. I know I could let GitHub Actions fetch it from the manufacturer's website, Texas Instruments, using a program like Viget. But the problem with that approach is that the link to the tool chain will likely break at some point, for example, when TI decides to upgrade the toolchain and it's also a bit wasteful having to fetch it each time the CI job runs. So I think having a ready-made docker container that I can trust to be a much better approach in this case. I will start by creating the docker container that will include the toolchain that I'm using. So let's first install docker on my Ubuntu machine. And to avoid having to run docker with uh, root permissions or prefixing each command with sudo, I'm going to create a docker group and then I'm going to add my user to that group. So sudo group add docker. Now I've already created this before, so it already exists. And then I will add my user to this group like that. And to avoid having to log out and log in for this to take effect, I can instead use the new group command. So now I can run docker without prefixing each command with sudo. So now I'm going to create the docker file. And I'm only just create it under the tools uh, directory. So I can also remove the placeholder file here now. And create docker file. And I'm going to use the latest uh, Ubuntu version for this docker container. So that's going to be from Ubuntu 22.4. And then there are some programs that are not installed by default that I want to install so that I can uh, download and uh, unpack the toolchain. And I'm also going to add a normal user to this container so that I don't always have to be root when I'm inside it. And that's all I need to specify in this Docker file. There is not that much to it. So now we'll build this Docker container and I'm going to name it MSP430 GCC. Oh, I also have to point to this directory. So now Docker is setting up this new container. And to see that it's been created, I can run docker images and there it is. So with the container created, I'm going to log into it so that I can download the toolchain to it. You normally download the toolchain from TI's website, but since I'm going to download it from the command line now, I have to do things a bit differently. So let's just jump to TI's website. And I'm just going to grab the link for the toolchain from here. So that's going to be the 64-bit version for Linux. It's going to be this link 
And now I'm going to download this package from the command line using a tool called vget, which I made sure got installed inside with my Docker file. So I can just paste the link here. I also have to download the support files, which contains uh, some of the header files I'm relying on, as well as the linker scripts. And those are available down here. So doing the same for this. And then I'm going to create a folder where I can put this, a folder named similarly to how I name it on my host machine. So that's going to be dev slash tools. And I also have to unpack the tool chain and the support files. And then I'm going to move the support files into the tool chain folder. Here. And I'm moving them to this include folder because that's how it's set up when you use the installer from your desktop environment, the installer that TI provides. So once I've done that, I can move this toolchain folder to my dev tools folder. And I'm going to name that MSP430 GCC. And now I can also remove the files I don't need anymore. Like that. So now the container have everything it needs, so I can exit from it and commit my changes. I can run docker ps8 to find the most recent session that I'm going to commit. And I will name this artful bytes msp430 gcc dash the version that I'm using. So that's 9.3.1.11. And then the tag, which I will just name latest. So by executing this command, I just save the changes that I just made into a new Docker container. So now I can run Docker images again. Okay, so this is the final container that includes the toolchain and the container that I will be using from GitHub Actions. And to make this container available from GitHub Actions, I'm now going to push this container to Docker Hub, which is a hosting platform for Docker containers, similar to how GitHub is a hosting platform for Git repositories. So going to Docker Hub, creating a new repository, and I'm going to give this the same name as the local container. And just a short description. So logging into Docker Hub and pushing the container. That was it for the Docker part of this video. Let's now move on to creating the GitHub actions for the repository. So for GitHub to pick up the configuration file, you have to create the file under a specific directory called GitHub workflows. And then the configuration file, I'm just going to name it CI. It doesn't really matter. So first I'm going to specify when I want this action to trigger. And that's going to be every time I push a new commit. And then I'm going to specify a job. I'm going to name it build and static analysis and then I want to run it on an Ubuntu machine and then I'm going to specify that I want to run it inside a docker container the container that I just created so that's going to be this one and then specifying the things I want this job to do so first of all it has to check out the repository and for that I will use the following action and this action is described in the documentation of github actions but it just basically checks out the repository and then there are two things I want my CS system to do first of all I want it to build my project so that's just going to be running make from the command line and then I also want to run static analysis uh, what I showed you in the last video so it's quite simple actually uh, the first action is just going to be simply make then the second one is going to be make cdp check like that so let's save this and look at the status and let's add the changes to a new commit and commit them and writing a commit message following the conventional commits guidelines and pushing it to github and heading over to GitHub, which now find the GitHub action there. So under this tab, and it seemed to have failed for some reason. Oh yeah, the issue is that I'm using the wrong indentation, so let's just quickly fix that. And adding it, and just amending the same commit, and then 
force push it. And now there's another thing I want to configure for this repository and I want to make it so that I can't even merge a commit unless it passes the CI system. So I'm going to disallow pushing things directly to the main branch and I'm also going to make it so that pull requests can't be merged until they pass the CI system. So to do that I'm going to set up a branch rule and the name pattern is just going to be main because this is just for the main branch so i'm going to require a pull request before merging no approvals because i'm the only one working on this project and then require status checks before merging and also that the branch has to be up to date before merging and then not allow anyone to bypass these settings that is myself and then also add the action it has to pass so like that so let's now have a look if the action passed the second time. It seems to be another error. So it successfully set up the job, initialized the container, checked out the repository, but then failed on building the project. And that's because the path to the toolchain is incorrect, because the home folder of the container is actually named Ubuntu and not AB. I'm going to fix this by making my makefile a bit more general. Okay, so before I update the make file, let's now start following the new workflow that I want to be following throughout this video series. So each change that I make, I'm going to start by creating a new local branch. So that's going to be git checkout dash b and then the branch name. And now updating the make file. And to make this make file a bit more general, I'm instead going to let the tools path be passed as an environment variable. Tools there. like this and running make now I have to pass the tools path explicitly that's going to be this and if I want to avoid writing this each time I could also specify this variable inside my bash profile but I'm not going to do that for now and adding this as a new commit And before I push this to the correct branch, I can actually test to push this to the main branch now to show you that the branch rule actually prohibits me from doing that. And yes, it works as expected. This status check is enforced on the main branch, so I have to push it to the correct branch. And going back to GitHub, I can create a new pull request like this. And at this stage of the workflow, once I've created a pull request, this is usually where other programmers would review my code. But of course, I'm a sole developer in this project and no one else is going to review my code. But I actually find it quite nice to go over my changes a second time within the pull request. Because sometimes I find that being in another coding environment or another code editor actually makes me find additional uh, issues. So I usually review my own pull request, even if that seems a bit silly. So let's also have a look if it passed the CI system, and it did not, so let's have a look at why it didn't. Fail to run make again, and that's because the tools path is not actually specified, and it's not because I haven't actually updated the workflow configuration file. So let's do that. So this is going to be the path to the tools directory inside the docker container, like this. And I don't need to specify the tools path for the second command here, since it's not actually using anything from the tools directory. So this is enough. And I'm just going to update this and run git commit amend on the same commit. And now I will push this or force push this to the same pull request by issuing git push and force with lease. And what this option does is that it does a force push, but it will prohibit me from pushing to a pull request that has been updated by someone else. In general, you should avoid force pushing your commits, but updating pull request is one case where I think force pushing actually makes sense. And finally, the CI run was successful, so now I'm allowed to merge my pull request. And just to avoid the ugly merge commit message, I'm going to choose this uh, option instead, rebase and merge. So with this option, it's just going to add this commit to the top of the main branch. And now the main branch includes the commit that I just made, and I can be sure that the main branch actually builds and passes static analysis. 
one thing I can note about this pipeline is that what takes time here is initializing the docker container. So each time the action triggers, it's actually fetching and setting up the container each time. And that's a bit wasteful since the container is the same each time the job runs. I think there are ways to improve on this by saving the container or caching the container so that it can be reused instead of having to be fetched each time. But I haven't looked further into it and it's only taking 15 seconds and that's something I can live with. This was all for this video. Now I have a CS system and workflow in place that I will be using throughout the rest of this video series. Yes, it's simple. It just builds the project and runs static analysis on it and a proper CS system would have a much more rigorous testing and analysis. But one can also argue that the CS system that I set up here, simple as it is, is actually overkill for a one-man project like this. But so is many of the other things that I'm doing in this video series. And that's because one of my aim with this series is to also give you a sense of some good professional practices. And one last thing, the end of this video also marks the end of the setup phase. And in the next video, it's time for me to finally start writing some code. So see you in the next video.